a Scottish folk singer whose work is rooted deeply in singing traditions of the northeast of Scotland. She has been described as magical and charismatic by Rolling Stone France, to which I will attest. <laughs> it's true. She is very charming and very magical. Uh, she's been a finalist in the BBC Radio Scotland Young Traditional Musician of the Year and was nominated for Folk Band of the Year at the MG Alba Scots Trad Music Awards in 2019. Silent walking, I could hear them talking, saying surely he's an honest man. Ayana, thanks so much for uh, doing this interview with me. You're here for the Global Music Matched. Please tell us a bit about your musical journey and how did you get into the traditional music practice? Um, it was really natural. So when my, my parents aren't musical at all, but some of my extended family members are. So back in 2003, when I was five years old, um, they took me to a folk festival, which was run by the Traditional Music and Song Association of Scotland, um, which I'm now a director of. And Aww. they asked me to learn a little poem. And then I competed in a competition called the Doric Poetry Competition, but the same festival had like piano competition or fiddle competition or like a traditional singing competition. But I just did the poem and um, I won. So my first ever performance on stage was like at the prize winners concerts. And it was on that night that I met other, um, well, I met singers, uh, tradition beaters, um, people who sung traditional ballads, um, who encouraged me and said, well, if you're going to do poetry reading, then why don't you just put a melody to it and you can enter in the traditional singing? Because it's the same, it's pretty much the same thing, you know, Doric poems, Doric songs, and Doric is the dialect that people talk in, uh, in Aberdeenshire, in the northeast of Scotland. So that's kind of what happened initially and then I kept going back each year to more and more festivals, more and more folk clubs, folk festivals, sing arounds where everyone just shares songs and I met lots of like tradition bearers, much older people who would pass down songs to me and then when I was maybe in my early teens I kept on getting kind of booked at festivals and folk clubs and people were asking me to perform and then I um, auditioned for a place at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland to do a degree in traditional music uh, at 16 and I got in and um, I thought I'd better go because not a lot of 16 year olds get in and you're not allowed to defer so you have to go the year that you get in so I moved away from my rural homeland of Aberdeenshire to go to Glasgow to study um, for a degree in traditional music, which is quite paradoxical because traditional music you learn from going to, you know, sing arounds or you learn from your elders or, or from other people. It's not very, it's not a long standing tradition that traditional music is taught in a degree. So it was a crazy four years, but it was four years that allowed me to have the time to really develop my career. And by the end of my four years, I was so busy touring and recording and working that I really struggled to go to class. Yeah. <laughs> I graduated at the end. And yeah, so I would guess, what kind of influence do you feel like having that academic structure to what is traditionally um, a, a a tradition, <laughs> something that's hand down. Like, how did that influence your experience with the tradition? That's because like, that's a unique, I guess, experience. Well, I listened to. I mean, growing up, I would listen to all these older folk singers um, uh, in that remit. But also, I would listen to like singers like Casey Musgraves and Taylor Swift and all that. Like, I really like country music. Um, and nowadays, I really like listening to like bluegrass and old time and Appalachian music. Um, I also studied classical song for a bit, a little bit of musical theatre as well. So I had quite a broad range. I mean, I kind of used to like metal music. It was it was odd, but 
music was kind of what brought me, you know, it was a voicing of place. It was my identity, my cultural identity as well. And um, it was it was where I could sing in the same dialect as I spoke in. You know, mm. there's a lot of people who, who don't sing how they speak. And for me, that's quite authentic to be able to um, sing and speak in the same kind of register. But nowadays I can sing both in Scots, Doric and English. And I recently released an EP in English called Dark Turn of Mind. And that really showed people that I wasn't just a one trick pony. I was happy to sing in, in English too, to make yeah. myself a little bit more accessible because um, Scots and Doric is, is very niche. There's only one country that's gonna understand that. Um, although I have traveled all over the world, you know, it's, it's a Germanic language, so it's, it belongs to that, you know, family group of languages. So people do understand, you just have to kind of get it through to them and do introductions. But saying that, oh, it's, it's such a confusing, oh my God, my hair's wild. It's such a confusing, <laughs> confusing musical journey, really. But I think I ended up where, where I ended up. That's great that, yeah, you, you can branch out and do things and, and, and show the range of what you're able to do. But then also that, you know, really unique cultural expression of the area you're from is something, a gift that you have to give to all of those um, places that you've traveled and toured. It's, it's beautiful. Um, I guess, yeah, you spoke to this a little bit of what does it mean to you to be part of this musical tradition? Um, could, you mentioned that yeah it's that you're you're sharing you're singing in the lang in the dialect of where you're from and you're expressing where you're from is there something else you could speak to about the meaning behind yeah, it yeah i think the meaning is like some of the songs that i sing the ballads that i sing they're ancient they're like 200 years old but their message still carries today um some of them are incredibly important when it comes to you know the treatment of women um, we have a snapshot of what happened 400 years ago, but it's still relevant today. For example, there's a song, there's a song uh, that is about a woman who fell in love with the wrong person and her family killed her. And it's a true story. It's called Melita of Tiftizani. And it was basically 11 miles from where I grew up, this happened. Wow. And you can go back and see her gravestone. And, you know, in parish records, she exists. Um, it was like 1643 or something. Um, and that's a long time for people to still be singing and spreading her message in solidarity with her. So some of yeah. these ballads, they are, you know, my mum always goes, I don't know why you sing all that old stuff. You'll never be successful. But I'm like, but the meaning is important to carry on those songs and stories because they're there to warn, to be a cautionary tale, to try and change the world. Um, but I'm, I'm really inspired by lots of different music. I mean, there's ballad collections in America that I love, although they're mostly songs that came over from England and Scotland. <laughs> so there's a kind of chasing of tradition. Our, our ballad tradition from the northeast of Scotland is universal. All over the world there are songs with our settlers, of course. We took the songs with us. So um, you can find really cool Appalachian versions of songs that come from my area. Wow. So I love that. I love seeing the omnipresence of my tradition shared throughout the world. Have you performed any of those songs in, you know, different styles in that, where they've travelled? Yeah, so I, um, I made that Dark Turn of Mind EP and recorded two ballads. Yeah, two ballads, or one ballad, that was kind of originally from the UK, Aberdeenshire, um, and then went over to the Appalachian Mountains, Kentucky. So I, I, I learned that, that version and sung it in English. Wow. But um, it's, yeah, I just think it's the same canon of music, and it's usually in old ballad books. But now that we have the internet, I can listen to, like, archived recordings of, you know, traditional singers uh, like Sheila K. Adams, um, Jean Ritchie, like really important um, figures in the American folk music kind of history. So it's, it's really cool. But I think that my tradition is so spread out that I really want to look more into the ballads that went to America because, mm. a lot of them, you know, they've become much more accessible and singing them in English is cool, but I won't forget like my roots. Yeah, oh, that's so beautiful that there's that connection to the past and also the future. I think that is 
part of that is hand in hand of what comes with being a tradition. And it's so moving that that story has meant something to people for so for so many years, for centuries, and that uh, I guess it shows how powerful that message is as a testament that it has lasted that long and now you get to uh, get to continue that expression it's really beautiful um i wanted to ask so you know it's i it's not super familiar to me i grew up um playing klezmer music uh which is you know from jewish traditional music where i'm singing the songs that i learned from my father and they're they're set there's not so much uh there's not so much improvisation. I mean, you can, maybe the way that you play them and the tempo and the speed and the order, you know, we do big medleys, we do like a horror set. So I guess, you know, being an outsider to the tradition, I hope it's not a silly question, but are there elements of improvisation in 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 your tradition? And, and you know, how much control and say do you have over the way that the songs are performed? Um, so I think like live improvisation, I don't really tend to do. However, a lot of the improvisation and editing and, um, you know, rearranging of text and melody and deciding on your ornaments and your nuances, I think all that comes kind of before the, you know, the, before the performance. So I, I don't really improvise too much. Sometimes I might sing, a, you know what, that's a lie because I could stand up and sing <laughs> one unaccompanied song and one day I could sing it one way, and then the next day I could sing it completely different, move things around, shift the text. Like mm. a lot of singers, um, especially really uh, like tradition bearer source singers, they would they would do that and they would change the nuances and they would change uh, phrasing based on how they wanted to kind of put out the song. So, for example, if a source singer was singing colloquially in a Kaylee with all of her family, they might sing it differently as to how they would sing it to, for example, a folklorist or a song collector. So I think that there's an element of improvisation, perhaps in every song, but I think more and more I've been touring with my band, which I just, it's under my own name. I have like a, either guitarist and fiddler or mandolinist. And I think that for sake of, you know, their sanity, I really don't improvise that much. <laughs> But I think, you know, it comes with the editing of the text and the melodies. I think traditional singing is, I don't really write that much, um, but what I do is write from tradition. So, for example, if I go on an online archive, um, for example, the Max Hunter folk song at Missouri State University, and I find a text and I go, oh, that's an Afaboni text. I like that. I'll write a melody for it. Yeah. Or other way around like I'll find a melody and maybe write a text for that melody um, and I've done both ways but sometimes it's just about finding a, a ballad and editing it and then interpreting it as is but other ways you can be more creative and do more elements of writing but a lot of people say oh are you going to write more songs yourself because you've done a few and I'm like probably not not right now I mean all I've done for the last like four years is study work and tour I haven't experienced anything to write about you know, well, I, I really haven't. It's just been hard work, work. So maybe if I have some more life experience, I mean, I'm 22 right now. And yeah. I, I think you've had a wealth of experience. And even just, just to be part of this tradition is, you know, I think there are things to say about it as well. But, you know, that's, I think when you're, when you're ready, when you have something to say, you'll know, and that'll be what you have to say. But yeah, it, it sounds like you've had a huge wealth of experiences. Um, that's just, so that's fascinating that yeah you can you find these traditional texts and you're you're bringing them back to life or you're you're giving them a new life with the new um you know melding with your own um compositions melodically or, or lyrically and then how does it go so you bring them to your band and do they build the, the music around what you've created it really depends so it depends what the function of the the song will be um for example if i want to record it for like an album or something, what I would do is I would kind of figure out my melody, figure out my final text. And then I'd like play on piano a little bit and like work out the chords and maybe think of an arrangement structure. And then I would bring it to like the band or a band or a few different musicians that I want to work with. But it depends on what the song is for. You know, if I want to just, if it's for like a ballad competition, then I probably won't really arrange it for piano or for band um but yeah that that's kind of the the structure of 
of what I do. Um, yeah, it's kind of fun. That's cool. And so you said in, in this, in your current band, you have, uh, did you say violin, uh, mandolin? What was the instrumentation? So yeah, yeah. So, um, for the touring outfit, I would have a guitarist and either a fiddler or a mandolin. Um, it depends because sometimes I've been working with another pianist because I don't play piano live. No, I just do the singing. That's all. Doing piano live really just stresses me out. It's just a fourth wall. I can't get my narrative across because I'm constantly, I'm like, am I doing this right? Um, so it really depends. Um, the band kind of changes. Like a few years ago when I was doing less um, Appalachian-y kind of ballad less English and more really, really Scots stuff, I had a piper. Not like a bag piper, but like a border pipe. Okay. Like small, small pipes. But I think my music has evolved um, differently in that I don't think that instrument necessarily works with my music anymore. So, you know, I've switched that from mandolin because of how it makes the music sound. Because um, my Away From My Window album sounds absolutely completely different from the Dark Turn of Mind EP um, because I just think that I'm kind of moving a little bit somewhere else. Hmm. And um, do, you, do you have like a favorite sort of set up instrumentation wise to perform with or is it just d depending on what on the material I guess I mean if I had my way and I had like unlimited finances then I would be really playing with a big big sounding band you know a big kind of folk band sound um but you only get that kind of opportunity once in a blue moon like Celtic Connections gives you like a launch gig or something um I don't know, I think I just like playing with people who are really invested in my music because I think my music can be quite taxing. There's a lot of long songs, um, narrative songs that kind of take some time to um, to do and they need to like keep the attention. So people who are just invested in my music, I like playing with them. But um, no, I, I do like guitar, it really makes things, yeah, definitely makes it sound less prolonged and protracted some of these songs are really long so <laughs> what's the longest what's the longest song um like 18 verses oh wow and that's a short version of that song <laughs> like, i wouldn't do that i wouldn't do like a whole 90 minutes of 18 verse ones i would do some like three verse ones too like it's just you try and sprinkle it but in folk clubs in the uk i mean people really like listening to old ballads so it, I think it's just like know your audience. Um, it depends on on what where you are. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've been watching your YouTube videos, and you have you know you have just the most stunning voice, and um, I've, I've really enjoyed listening to your music and um, on on YouTube and on Spotify as well, uh, where you have you know, quite a few releases from 2015 was is that was that your first release the start, would, starting I mean, songs i think what was it called yeah no i would say like the i kind of draw a line under that no that's really bad oh. i think the first release would i would count would be the east ep okay um so i was 18 and it was the first time i had released anything with other musicians so i feel like the first songs that was just i just want to draw a line under it it sounds uh. bad um <laughs> But like, I think that's fat. Like I keep it up there because I want people to know how, how much I've tried to work on myself. Yeah. But if the East EP thing, yeah, that was done really quickly. I was just turned 18. Like it was a thing, you know, it was fun. But then I was still trying to figure out my sound. Um, I sound very different because I had some ENT issues at the time. I had surgery, like, um, I think my voice has really changed over the last few years for the better because, you know, when you're 18, 19, you're still kind of developing. And then I did vocal training at my conservatoire and I had a really great musical theatre coach who I did folk songs with. I didn't do musical theatre with her, I did folk songs with her. So she really helped. So I think I only really count away from my window and dark turn of mind as something that I actually like. <laughs> yeah. Don't you think, but I, I don't know, I'm 33 now and I feel like my voice has developed that much every couple of years, you know, I always feel like I try not to cringe too much about everything in the past. <laughs> I, I thought it was beautiful. I mean, everything that I listened to, but yeah, so, um, 
So you feel like really the last three years is when you've developed your sound and your tone. I uh, think so. Yeah. And is there sing particular singers that you look that that you draw from, that you draw inspiration from in your approach? Um, in terms of um, songs or no, in in terms of like your tone, in terms of your uh, your technique. I know. I guess you've you've studied under different teachers, but yeah, more more the sound, more the sound that you're that you're choosing. Mm -hmm. If you I feel like you have a choice over it <laughs> at all, anyway. Um, well, I did like some still vocal training. Yeah, yes. I, like a tiny, tiny amount of it. Um, I don't know. It really depends because I think I would have different, not different registers, but like I think I'd use my voice differently depending on what I'm singing and also what language I'm singing in. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Scots has like different vowel sounds and different like words and different, it's a different language. Mm. So I think I would kind of alter my, alter my register based on context really. But I, I don't like listen to an artist and be like, right, that's the tone I'm going for. But I do mm. like the tones of people like uh, Sarah DeRose and Molly Tuttle and Sierra Hall and Laura Cortese. I really like those people's tones. Mm. Um, yeah, but I wouldn't, I really don't want, oh, that's yeah, kind of not, to, not necessarily <laughs> emulating, but just, yeah, that's, that's more the question, like, yeah, somebody who, whose tones you, you really like, but that's, that's so interesting that you mentioned that, do you think that um, singing in different languages has opened up your approach, because you are using different vowel shapes and sounds than, than other people get to, so maybe your vocabulary is, is bigger in some ways. Yeah, I, I think so, because, like, for example, um, in English, if you put, like, where, it's where, like, where are you going? But in Scots, it's war, like, what are you going? And in Doric, it's far, like, far are you going? So there is many different words to describe one word. So it really, it really definitely makes you think a lot more about, like, your how to pronounce different things because it is a different language um yeah i think it's it's funny like that that's cool um so yeah i, I was saying I, as well as watching your youtube video sometimes you perform with a band called the alderners is that uh is that a band that you that you were part of or just a band that you collaborate with often and now i see you've got a band that perform under your name or any of the the players some of the same? Um, so the Aldeners, um, we all met when we were studying at university. The mandolinist, he's from Scotland, but he studied at East Tennessee State University, he studied bluegrass. Um, the cellist, she, she's from America originally, um, and she came over here to do her, her kind of uh, master's and her PhD. So we all have the love for bluegrass and old time and when we were in our final year of the traditional music course we kind of uh, tapped into that because we had time at uni to do that and we just thought we'd kind of make a band out of that and I really like that it's kind of a separate entity there's some repertoire that's shared um simply because we we didn't have time to look at other repertoire so we kind of shared the same repertoire of what I was doing in my own kind of solo career and that they were totally fine with that I think we're hopefully maybe going to record sometime soon, um, but it's it's difficult because I think that, um, you know, admin, it just doubles the amount of admin, you know, the more projects that's going on. So I'm really struggling with that myself. So I think we'll see what the what the crack is, but I think um, having that as a side project is, is really great creative output because I'm sure there are, there's definitely folk clubs uh, in the UK and people come to see me because they, they want me to do songs like Scottish songs. So mm. if, I, if I infiltrate my set with kind of Appalachian Americana songs, they won't be happy. So doing the Aldeners gives me kind of another creative outlet to do that. Uh, so yeah. it's, it's really nice and they're smashing musicians. Like they're so, so good. And also it's not often that you have a band that doesn't have an accompanying instrument. So mandolin and cello, they're solo instruments in their own right. But when we do, you know, tunes and songs, they have to work together to create that accompaniment 
and it's a really it's not a very common um approach so it's, it's really cool nice yeah I, I really enjoyed those videos um and so you mentioned that you play piano is um is that the only other instrument that you play when did you start learning piano oh i'm i was like seven i think i actually like piano was like my first instrument before i really found my voice um, and I studied it, you know, all through school and in my grades and um, studied it at university as well. So I had piano lessons from a traditional pianist um, called James Ross and he studied under some great uh, piano tutors. And the idea of trad piano is um, very different. It's like you're playing trad tunes on the right hand and accompanying on the left, but it's, it's not using piano necessarily as like an accompanying instrument only. It's like using it as like a, a tune thing uh, as well. So it was really fun. And um, I think I learned a lot about arranging um, and I still use it to arrange, but it just gives me the fear like doing it live. Like I just rather, I'd rather employ another pianist than touch the piano myself. Yeah, and then you can concentrate on, on your singing and, and performing, yeah. Um, so you've toured, you've toured extensively, you've performed around Europe, through UK, Germany, Czech Republic, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, France, Poland, Australia, Canada. Uh, what have been some of your favourite experiences with touring? It, it really depends because we've had some mental, mental experiences, like absolute madness. <laughs> um, I think it's like being with the the band. I love, I prefer touring with, you know, with the guitarist or with, you know, the duo or the trio. I really, really hate just doing solo gigs. I just can't stand it because it's, it's lonely. Um, so I've had some really fun times, mostly because if there's a situation, it's a bit wild and like, you know, this is like, we turned up to um, our accommodation in Poland this time last year. And the guy was like, do you like cats? We have 20 of them. <laughs> and like the boys were so allergic, like unbelievable allergic. And I was like, I like there were 20 little feral kittens. They were all feral. <laughs> but I was like in amongst them, like petting them. And we were staying there for a few nights as we were doing the like, gigs. And like the boys were unbelievably allergic. And it was very funny. Um, but yeah, things like that, like situations where like, it, you know they just it, it's fun so I think it depends I love the Czech Republic I did a gig in the Czech Republic last year and it was so so cool I really really want to do more in in eastern in the east basically um I feel like the people there are very similar to Scottish people hmm. um, I, yes although I was supposed to be in America this year doing like a west coast tour yeah. um which would have been really fun but it just there's no way i'm coming there right now <laughs> no way um, <laughs> yeah i think traveling is my favorite actual part of the whole thing i mean i've done loads in germany and i love it there and they love scottish and irish music and it's just it's just so nice to like go anywhere in the world and people like you know the identity the cultural identity i think that that's Scottish people are really blessed with that. Mm. Do you feel like different places respond to differently or just, I don't know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like, it's, it's really tricky, like, being, being a folk singer, I've got a lot of repertoire, which um, can, it, it's really context depending. So there's some songs which mean one thing in one country and one thing in another country. So for example, I was in New Orleans in January and I sung a few kind of leftist songs, um, one called Freedom Come All Ye, which is mainly about Scottish independence um, and anti-imperial, well, anti-war, anti-imperial, anti, -imperial, anti like, basically just like be a good person. That's the kind of, that's the kind of gist of that song. And then I sung um, a version of the Internationale, Billy Bragg song. So that went down really well within that community of practice that I was singing it to. And in the folk clubs of the UK, that goes down really well because a lot of folkies are kind of left leaning. However, if I sung, for example, the Internationale on tour in Poland, it would probably be extremely offensive um, because, you know, the Soviet um, 
government they, they used that as their oh, as their, their theme tune what's it what's it called when a country has like a theme tune an anthem. Their, like, national anthem yeah so it's all within context and i think wow. like being a folk singer you really have to like be clued up on every country's history that you go to because you could end up kind of offending um offending people even though you don't mean to be you know in, in america the international is you know a working class like song about the people you know rising up but in in poland or maybe in some parts of the the eastern bloc it's it kind of is a song of oppression so you really it, there's a responsibility yeah, yeah. as a folk singer to do your research and know what's acceptable in some places and what's not wow um i I guess, yeah, I'm sorry that you missed out on coming to, to the West Coast, but I hope when everything is, is different, when you come, I'll get to come to the show and hear you. <laughs> that would be so lovely. But you'll be on tour at the time, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's what happens. Like, there's so many good gigs in Glasgow, and I'm like, oh, that band's coming to Glasgow, I'm going to go. And then I'm on tour anyway. So like last year, my guitarist and I became obsessed with a podcast called My Favourite Murder. And it is literally like a true crime podcast, comedy podcast. It's cool. It's really cool. And it's two women who grew up um, in, in LA, um, Orange County and oh, well, California and Sacramento. And they are just great. And we have listened to them all, like all the tours that we did, we just put the podcast on. And we found out that they were coming to Glasgow. And we were like, we have to get tickets. And then we looked at our diaries, me and my guitarist. And he was like, we've got a gig then. I was like, yeah. Damn. You know, so it's like a lot of the time, I think that your music career really overtakes your personal life. Because I would yes. have loved to have done that. And a lot Absolutely. of other <laughs> Absolutely takes over. Yeah, I think people don't understand, like, you, you miss so many things at home, weddings, funerals, birthdays, all the special moments that are in people's lives that, you know, you need to be at. It's a, it's a sacrifice, but I remember explaining that to my cousins last time I went home to visit, you know, like, I'm always with you, but I can't be there for all the important things and stuff. But I think we're lucky that we have that passion in our lives and something that, yeah, that, is, that we love enough to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. The fact is, is that we want to give up these things because we love what we do. And that is, that's so, like, so blessed to be able to do that. Not without a lot of hard work, um, yeah. but it's, it's really cool. And I like that. And so I guess, yeah, speaking of touring and, and COVID and everything, how, how, has, how have you pivoted? How have you um, adjusted to the new situation and... and, and with your releases moving forward yeah what's the plan how how has it been for you anxiety um <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so um i made a patreon account which has been cool i've only got like 42 patrons so i'm really trying to like push that um because it's really great it really you know it gives you some you know help um which i like that i can be creative with it too i've done some live streams and i've used bandcamp to like ticket it and I feel like people's been so generous. Mm. However, there's only, you know, so far that people can go in this uh, financial climate. We're way into the worst recession that the UK's faced in 200 years. Like, I don't, I don't know. So I've done live streams. I've done the patron thing. Um, I have like one student that I teach. She's actually um, based in Miami. So it, it's kind of cool. And she learns Scott songs, um, which is awesome. I want to do more of that. Um, I've done like some sort of, I've done unaccompanied ballads uh, EP, but oh, that's yeah. not for the faint hearted. As you can imagine, it's like you really have to be into your ballads to enjoy that. And luckily there are people who, who like that. But um, so I've done some, some releases, but not like, I'm currently at the stage where I'm like, oh, I kind of need to make like a new album with band, you know, a, a full proper album, not just like a Bandcamp digital download thing. So I, I kind of need to, you know, get my get my bum in gear and do that and maybe apply for some funding. I know what it's going to be about. It's going to be a concept album using, um, there's a thing called the James Madison Carpenter Collection that the National Library of Congress um, and the University of Aberdeen and the English Folk Song and Dance Society in England 
all collaborated on and James Madison Carpenter was a folk song collector who came to the UK and came to Scotland and collected lots of singers from my area um, and he was the first to record them so he was like a pioneering dude and only two years ago did all of his work finally get published so wow. I wonder if it would be really cool to do a project based around that um, but I mean, my issue is money. Like I've had to use all my reserves just to pay my rent. Um, you know, the government hasn't done much to help musicians here. So I think the issue is, is money really, which is, is really, really sad. So everyone, please join Ona's Patreon. You're going to get some fantastic content and you're going to support an amazing, amazing musician and artist. That is very, very kind of you to see. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, so what kind of things do you do with your Patreons? Like, what can everyone expect when they join? Well, um, I, I really need to do one of these, but kind of I have a tier for um, traditional ballad um, workshops where there are a lot of work. I basically teach a ballad in both Scots and English and I put up all my research and a oh. Scots language guide and all the contextual research to the ballads, you know, where it's from, what happens in it, you know, who sung it, what collection it's from. And I put up, you know, translated verses in both Scots and English. So that's kind of what I, I have one tier that is for that. I really need to do more of that. It's just a lot of work. And then I have other tiers for like, you know, if I'm, I'll do like a cover or something, something that people don't normally mm. do. Doing. Because like a lot of the time, like I'm kind of confined to my repertoire, and I wouldn't be able to like do a Casey Musgraves cover live. So yeah. do things that I enjoy too. Um, you know, exclusive. Uh, they see things first before other people. Um, on Sunday, well, this will be wait once this is actually put out. Um, I'm doing like a Patreon hangout where like we're just going to chill out on Zoom and I can talk to people and just ask them how they're doing and have like a literally face to face communication with my followers, which will be really really fun if people choose to come along. Um, yes. so just different things like that. I always send people, you know, a little personalised card and a badge and a you know a sticker. Um, but like, yeah, I really just want to grow my Patreon. It, but it's a lot of work oh my goodness it's a lot of work yeah yeah work yeah. though awesome well um i guess those are the questions i have and uh, is there anything else that you want to share with anyone Everyone um, i actually don't don't think so just okay. um yeah just go ahead follow me on social media i speak a load of rubbish <laughs> you'll enjoy it um, another thing that I'm, I've been doing over lockdown is campaigning for a Scots Language Act. Um, so in Scotland we have three national languages. We have English, Gaelic and Scots. And Gaelic is kind of spoken in the West Coast and Scots is spoken in the East Coast. And I'm talking to you in English right now because you're talking to me in English right now. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how we, we do it. it. You know, if someone was talking to someone in Polish, they'd, they'd reply in Polish. Like, that's the crack. However, um, Gaelic and English are like recognised as legal languages, however Scots isn't. Um, so I've been part of a, a kind of campaign group to um, lobby government to pass a bill saying this is a protected real language. The European Charter for Minority Languages says that Scots is a real language. However, we don't have law in government in the UK or in Scotland to say that Scots are a language. So I've been yeah. really, really, um, you know, working with, when I was younger, I really wanted to be involved in politics. Um, and I feel like maybe working with this campaign kind of merges the, the two, because I, mm. so I speak in Scots and now I can kind of campaign for a Scots Language Act. Um, so I've been involved as their social media person. It's unpaid, but the thing is, is that I'm really passionate about it. And when that bill goes through, it's, it's going to be part of history yeah. for, for Scottish people. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing. And if anyone wants to uh, join up, then I will comment the link below because it's called Ur Vice, which um, isn't very easy to spell. It's like O-O-R-V-Y-C-E. It's spelled differently as to how it sounds because um, some people think Vice like V-I-C-E. So I'll, I'll put a link below once this goes goes live. It's really exciting. And you can, Thanks. if you like Scottish history, you know, if you like anything to do with Scotland, 
you can become a member, become part of our mailing list for free. And you know, that really helps our numbers because when we go to the government, we can go, look at all these people around the world who are interested in our language and who support us. So yeah, I mean, my personal mailing list is also open for people. And yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's cool, but I think sometimes I, you know, the things that I work for, I am, um, I, I put forward more than myself, which is yeah. kind of sad. But, so um, we'll, we'll, we'll include all the links to all the ways people can follow you and also the work that you do, which sounds like really important and really fascinating. And, you know, um, imagine that first gig that you do where you get to sing in spots after it's been established a legal language. I think that'll be something really, really special. And I, I wish that for you as soon as possible. Aww, thank you. That's really <laughs> cute. Oh, it's been so nice <laughs> talking to you. It's been lovely to talk with you. Thanks so much, Iona. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>